Grace and peace, and welcome to Bible after that nice, uh, quiet uh, hush. Um, Today we are are grateful to to gather together, whether we are online or or in person. um, It is great to be in the house of the Lord uh, to worship the God of grace. Um, This week we highlighted uh, Reverend Teresa Edwards, who's coming on staff staff very, very soon. Um, there's There's a fun little question and answer in the vine, I encourage you to check that out just to get to know her a little bit better as, as she uh, makes her way to us. And there's also a few ways to reach out um, and let her know that you're thinking about her um, and, and offer her some words of welcome. Um, we also uh, are looking for volunteers who want to help with our AV um, uh, if you can push a button and you have a good ear, uh, we could use your help on the soundboard, uh, be it at 9 or at 11. Um, just uh, see us, and, and we can kind of get some training uh, there for you. Um, I also want to highlight uh, our altar flowers this morning. They're very lovely, and, and they are dedicated to the glory of God and in loving memory of Dr. G. Michael Schaffner by Philippa Barbara uh, and Emily, and you'll also notice a little rosebud there um, as we sort of announce the new arrival of Hayes Andrew Huff, um, who was born on June the 28th, um, and he is the son of Mallory and Kyle Huff, the grandson of Carolyn and Larry McClendon. Um, and so we, uh, that, that's sort of what's going on in the life of the church. You can check out the Vine for more info uh, and also your bulletin of things coming Uh, together, but let us prepare our hearts uh, this morning for worship. I invite you to pick up a hymnal or take a look at the words on the screen. We'll be singing our opening hymn, which is number 708, Rejoice in God's Saints. And if we're rejoicing, that has to be a happy... You can't rejoice with a frown on your face, all right? So uh, let's, uh, let's stand together as we sing hymn number 708, Rejoice in God's Saints.
As we remain standing, let us affirm our faith together with the historic Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Let us pray. God, you are our strength and hope. This week you have constantly been at work, present with us, showing and bestowing grace in mighty and minuscule ways. Through the much-needed cooling rains that watered the earth, in moments of peace and comfort, in times of loss and frustration, in the smile and kindness of a stranger, through the intimate word found in holy scriptures that speaks to our hearts. Each day your grace heals and provides many times without our even knowing. Lord, help us to see more clearly and be grateful. Lord, we give thanks for that blessed gift of grace that is greater than our sin, both that claims and calls us to see your mighty hand at work. And we humbly ask that your mighty power would heal the nations as economies struggle and collapse. Lord, we pray that your peace would calm the chaos in places like Sri Lanka. Lord, we pray for the Soweto Township of South Africa where gunmen killed 15 people and many others are wounded. God, we pray that your justice would be had and families who lost loved ones would somehow be comforted. God, may your peace that passes all understanding somehow miraculous con- miraculously come to the people of Ukraine. May your peace temper the political vitriol and hatred and division within our own country. May holy peace be the life-changing option taken by those in our own city caught up in the cycle of violence and poverty. God, we pray for the hurting among us now, those who have lost, those who grieve, those faced with new diagnoses and illnesses. Lord, give us your healing touch. And may we be open and obedient to be instruments of your redemption for the places that we've named and those that are deep longings within our hearts. Let the love and light of Christ, may it shine through our words and deeds, pointing others to your great love and salvation. Give us eyes to see, courage to speak. Give us a bright hope found in Jesus to face the troubles of this world unafraid. God, we lift our hearts to you and join with the church from every time and place to pray the words that our Lord taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come.
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue in worship, I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing hymn number 451, Be Thou My Vision. You may be seated, and I invite the children to come join me down front. Come on. Good morning. Keep coming. All right. How's everybody doing today? I'm going to go all go that way. So I have something with me this morning. What, what do you know? What this is? You know what that is? You know what that's called? Anybody? I heard somebody out there say a level. A level. A level. So what do you do with a level? You level things, right? <laughs> All right. So let's say I wanted to make sure this board was level on my knees. I put it down. See, so y'all can see more over here. Come back. Come back over here. Y'all can see more. I can't do it that way. The stool's in the way. All right. So you see that little bubble? You see the bubble in there? If this side is too low, then where the bubble goes that way. If this side is too low, the bubble goes that way. And if you get it just right in the middle, the bubble's right in the middle. So you can measure. So if, you can do it this way, too. If, you, uh, if we want to make sure that this board is straight, if we're going to build a house and we want to make sure it's straight, you see that bubble on the bottom down there? You know, if I lean it this way, that's not straight. If I lean it this way, that's not straight. But if I get it just right in the middle, the bubble's in the middle, and then that's straight up and down. So that's how you can figure out. Like if you were going to build a house, you could um, use a level uh, to, to help get it straight. Now, what do I have here? What's that? Do you know what that is? It's a string with a wrench on it. That's exactly right. All right. Why would I have a string with a wrench on it? No idea. Anybody want to help them out there? Plumb line. All right. That's a plumb line. And that you could use that if you didn't have a level, you could use that to help you get your building square because it would hang straight down. And if it just hangs free, it hangs straight down. And then if I get my board, then I, I can know, is my board straight or is my board crooked? Now, if I start building a house and the wall looks like this when I start, is it going to be very strong? No. It's, what's it going to do? Fall down, right? Or if I start building a house and the wall's out pointed out this way towards the front yard, what's it going to do? Fall down. 
You got to get it straight and square and true. And the plumb line is a way you can do that. If you don't have a level, you can use a plumb line and you can, and we have, it's amazing thing is for our life, God has given us a plumb line. God has given us the Bible as a way for us to know what's level, what's straight and what's not. And so we study the Bible, we come to church, we spend time in children's church with Miss Reese, we go to vacation Bible school, we, at a family time we talk at home about what's right and wrong, and that's the way that God helps us learn from the Bible what's straight, what's right, what's true. So when you see a building, if you look at something and it's a little crooked, you remember that, that plumb line and that you want to be what? You want to be plumb, you want to be straight, you want to be right. And God's word is a way to teach us to be there. Let's bow for prayer. Well, God, we give you thanks that you've provided a way for us to know what is right and what is wrong, that you have spoken your word and you've given your spirit to live inside of us, to guide and direct us. We ask your blessing on this week. Help help us to walk the way that is right and plumb and square with your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Miss Reese is at the back back there waving. Let's pray. Holy God, source of all good things, as we give our gifts today, we ask that they be uh, dedicated to the work of your kingdom, that love, justice, and compassion would come into our midst. Lord, reveal to us the beauty and the ways that you care for us, and may our focus constantly be on you. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
You may be seated. Before I read the lesson for today, a, a word just to update. The uh, sanctuary renovation is coming along well. We, uh, uh, this past week, they completed, we inspected the ceiling. The new sheetrock is in, the paint's in, the grate's in, and it passed the inspection. Uh, and so everything is good there. They've insulated the attic. Um, so we're, we're back to there. So we'll start working our way down from the ceiling to the floor. Uh, they'll start taking the scaffolding out Monday morning, uh, and then we'll start the process of painting. Um, so it's coming right along on the inside. And on the outside, you may have noticed as you came down Forest, the, uh, the windows have been stripped down to the original 1926 or 25 wood. Uh, any rotten places replaced, and uh, they'll be painting out from there. But um, somebody stopped me the other day and said, what are they doing there? wearing hazmat suits. What have y'all got going at the church? Well, those bottom layers of paint were lead paint. And so when they do the stripping process, even though they're not putting it in the air, they're not grinding it, they're using a gel, but they still have to uh, wear those respirators so they don't get exposed to lead. So uh, no nuclear waste, just old paint. Um, So um, hear the word uh, from Amos chapter 7, beginning in verse 7. Our scripture lesson for today. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all of his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is the temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall become a prostitute in the city and your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword and your land shall be parceled out by line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land and Israel shall surely go into exile away from its land. The word of God for God's people today, thanks be to God. So have you been on a trip yet this summer? Uh, I've seen some of you on Facebook. uh, Isn't that what we do in summer is we go places, we pack the bags, we pack the car, and off we go. Last week I suggested that despite the price of gas, that the summer of 22 can be the journey of a lifetime. It can be a journey of exploration and of learning, and ultimately a journey to discover what's at the heart of our faith. That's the journey we hope to take in worship. Each week during our summer series, we'll have a traveling companion. One of the prophets will go with us. Prophets, they have a propensity to take us to the edge, even even maybe when we don't really want to go there. So the title of our series is Prophet Margins. We'll be taken to the edge by the prophets. And not all that we see will be comfortable or easy. Prophets, they have this frustrating habit of speaking an uncomfortable word of truth. And people, we have an even more frustrating habit of not listening to them. But what might it look like? What might it look like if we learned uh, to take the risk to listen If we took the risk to let these holy ones uh, come along and become our traveling companions, what might happen? Now, we might be troubled. 
but we also might be lifted up. We might be challenged, but we might find reasons for hope. We might find a renewed vision that inspires us. Last week, our companion on the first leg of our journey was Elisha. And we looked at the story of the interaction between Naaman and Elisha in 2 Kings 5. If, if you weren't here, if you were on one of those summer trips, it's on the website. You can go back and, and watch week one. Now, if Elisha wanted us to listen, then our prophet for today wants us to see. God's repeated word to Amos, his repeated question was, what do you see? Over and over again, God shows the prophet something and then asks the question, what do you see? It's an invitation, an invitation to pay attention, to take off the, the colored glasses and pull down the blinders, to slow down enough to notice. What do you see? I sometimes wonder how good a job we do at paying attention, really paying attention to the world around us. Whether we're going to work or to school, whether we are running errands or trying to fit some exercise into our week, do we look, really look around and see the state of our world and our nation and our neighborhood? Do we really see or do most of the time we look past or through or around people, situations, and circumstances? What do you see? God didn't ask Amos to go around his neighborhood God made a bigger ask of Amos. Amos is called to leave his home uh, in the southern kingdom of Judah and travel north to the kingdom of Israel. Now, this was roughly 2,800 years ago, um, and Amos uh, is reported by scholars to be the first of the prophetic books that was put into writing. But this was 2,800 years ago, so this was not yesterday. But the truth of Amos still holds true and valuable for us today. So Amos is told to go from his home down south to travel above the Mason-Dixon line to Israel. Um, and verse 10 um, says that he's going up there and Amaziah is the priest at Bethel. And that was the center of worship at that period of time in the north. Jerusalem in the south was the center of worship. Bethel in the north at that time. In the northern kingdom, the, the home, of sort of the power base of religion was at Bethel, which literally means house of God, which is why when you're traveling back roads across South Georgia and everywhere else, you see so many Bethel Baptist churches or Bethel Church or Bethel Church of God, because it literally means house of God. Beth is house, ale is God. So Beth El. So Amos is a southerner who's sent by God to the north to deliver a message. Chapter 7, the few verses before the ones I read, begins with God showing Amos something. He shows him locust. Now, a cloud of locusts could come in and wipe out the crops and cause famine and starvation just like that. He shows, and Amos begs God to spare the people, that they can't bear the locust. And, and Amos 7.3 says, the Lord relented, said he wouldn't send the locust. And then God shows Amos a shower of fire. And again, Amos petitions the Lord, and, and verse 6 says, The Lord relented. So the third vision that Amos is given, God shows Amos a plumb line. I bet he didn't have a wrench on his. You know what a plumb line is. We talked about it with the children. I learned about a plumb line at an early age. Uh, my father made his living as a doctor, but his recreation was building stuff. And so we built docks and decks and boathouses and seawalls and extra rooms. Um, and everything had to be just so. We measured with surgical precision. Um, and, and everything had to be straight and true perfectly. Now, so having, we would have strings and levels and, and you know, running all kind of ways to make sure it was straight in every direction. Now, having learned that, when I was on a construction mission project in Central America, and we started, we were building a house, we were working on expansion, I, I, I put up a plumb bob. 
the local um, builders, the construction workers that were local that were there helping from the church where we were serving, they, they looked at me and my plumb line with a little, with kind of with raised eyebrows. And even with my limited Spanish, I could understand that they were questioning whether I was a bit loco. Um, they, they operated by a different standard in that particular crew. It was the, what they said, it was mas or menos, more or less, you know. Close enough. Close enough. That's what they said. Now, that's not God's intention with Amos. It's not close enough. He, he shows him a plumb line, calls him to say, what do you see? He shows him a plumb line, and Amos is, in, is asked to see and interpret what it means. To see at a deeper level. Not just to say, I see a plumb line, but to, to say, what does it mean? To see it and make meaning from it. In a good spiritual practice, it is a good spiritual practice for us to, to notice things and to think about them. To ponder them at a deeper level. Not just to see, but to notice Think of it this way. You, you might ask the question as you go about your, your day, where, where do I see the handiwork of God? Where do I see the work of God today? Jesus um, uh, talked about this as well. We might think, well, is it going to be as obvious as a plumb line? When I go out uh, and I look for God at work in the world today, is it going to be as obvious as this string and wrench hanging here? Well, probably not. In fact, when Jesus talked about the work of God, he often said it, things like, uh, it's like a yeast in dough. It, it's like a pearl hidden in, in a field. It, 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 is, it is like um, a seed that's planted in the ground. It's a little thing that, that you've got to hunt for to find. We have to look harder. We have to look deeper to see. We, we have to interpret what we see. And understand the thing that we are looking at. Maybe you've heard the expression um, glory sightings or God sightings. Or I heard somebody use the phrase this week, a God wink uh, as an expression. And some of you, from the looks of you, some of you are going, nope, never heard that before. That's all right, I'm going to tell you. So, so the idea is to develop, we need to develop our ability to see God at work in the world. And one way to do that is to ask the question and to share the answer with one another on an occasional basis. To say, where have I seen God at work in the world? It's a great practice. Kids can do it. Adults can do it. To sit down at the dinner table every once in a while and say, you know, where, where have you seen God at work in the world this week or today or in the last couple of days? And, and it might be something as simple as the beauty of a flower or the wonder of a waterfall. Or it might have been that, that you thought to call somebody and, and that thought led to a conversation where you were able to help them. There were, but where? And you felt God was in that because you, you wouldn't have normally just made that phone call. So where have you seen God at work in the world? And, and the fact is, if we, if we go out looking for it, we are more likely to see and we share because we, we live in a distracted world and we have to be intentional about looking for this to see the handiwork of God. To develop the habit of regularly naming where we see God at work. It, it, it causes us to look for it. Instead of just going through our day, how fast can I get? We, we, we have our eyes open because we want to be able to share that we saw. Uh, and that's part, I think, of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus is to be alert, to be alive, and to have our eyes open to look for what's happening around us. To live believing that God's at work. That's the first step is that we believe God's at work. So then we look. Where? And to live with the joy when we see it and to call attention to it. To know. To be encouraged by the fact that God is at work. So the question is basically what do you see? So Amos. Amos has been noticing things. Amos has been paying attention deeply paying attention and God calls him away from his flocks and his tree surgeon business a dresser of sycamores um, and trimming branches God calls him away from those things and says I want you to go on a trip to the north and I want you to take a word to someone to the nation 
Now remember, Amos is a second career prophet. He, he, was a, he was a shepherd, a herdsman, and a dresser of sycamore trees from Tekoa, part of the northern kingdom of Georgia. Somebody's awake. When he announces this word that God has given him about the judgment on the wayward people in the north, um, he gets immediate resistance and, and backlash and pushback. You know, that's the way it is. The prophetic word always disturbs the one who you are using power in ways that are contrary to justice and liberation. God, God does not support oppressive governments and systems. And those who occupy those places are seldom willing just to let go of it. And so there's always pushback. As thanks for his faithfulness. Because he goes and announces this word, uh, Amos is attacked. He's, uh, he's slandered. He's fussed at. He's called a conspirator against the king. Amaziah, who was the priest in the house of Bethel. So he is essentially, uh, in that case, he's, he's right next to the king uh, in offering the religious guidance for the nation. And, and he confronts Amos because um, he's being challenged that he's not, he's not saying this word. And so he does, he, he could have fit in in today's political world just fine. Because when he's challenged and he's worried about how he might look, you know what he does? He spreads a rumor about the other guy. So he, he says, uh, he starts telling rumors about Amos. And r- rumors to this day fuel, they fuel politics and campaigns and, and they, do, they undermine credibility. And Amaziah tells Amos, you go back home and earn your bread as a prophet there. And to, to suggest that he's doing it for the money. That, that he's speaking the word for the money. You, you go back home and you earn your bread there. And he's, he calls him a seer, which was sort of a put down. He was sort of like saying, you're a fortune teller. You got your crystal ball. You go back home uh, and take your crystal ball back there. And Amos, Amos says, wait, 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 wait a minute. I am not a prophet or a son of a prophet. You know, he, he sort of feels um, a little bit threatened by Amaziah. Um, it, it's sort of like we might read it as both um, statement and threat a little bit. He might have said, if you know what's good for you, seer, you will go back home and, and you, you will go away from here. You'll be professional and you'll be realistic and you'll be smart, but mostly you'll be gone. You'll get out of town. He puts down Amos as a seer Amos replies, I'm not a prophet. I'm not a son of a prophet. He's basically saying, I'm not getting paid for this. This is not an office that I have. Um, It is not a family connection. This is not our family business. But I'm here because of divine revelation. Now, Now, before we go any further, that word ought to be empowerment and encouragement for all of you out there in the seats out there. Because Amos is an ordinary person. And the best people to share the word of God are ordinary, are ordinary people. People like Amos. They don't, they don't have to, you don't have to have a seminary degree or an ordination certificate or a clerical collar or a robe to bring God's word um, to people who desperately need it. The body of Christ is not made up of preachers, but people. And God works through all people, sometimes even those we least expect. So if you hear somebody saying, well, I'm just a member of the church, I'm not the pastor, you remind them of Amos, who who went and delivered the word, a shepherd and a dresser of sycamore trees, and God called him to be the messenger. Uh, We ought to, to hear at the very base level that God uses who God chooses, and that our restrictions and our expectations, they don't limit God. I believe that God has a call on your life. It may not be to travel far from home to share visions, but it could be. So even though Amos is called by God, it doesn't make his job easy. It's not smooth sailing. The opposition um, that he faces makes that clear. Despite the difficulties, that means for us, despite the difficulties, that we're called to speak God's word to a world um, that needs direction, that needs a standard and a gu- and guidance. 
Amos' mission is to, to speak the truth supersedes his own personal agenda and concerns. Part of the mission, part of the mission of the people of God, the church, is to make the world a better place by speaking truth to power locally, nationally, globally, while living in a way that shows fidelity to the word that we teach and preach. Now that's important enough to, to, for you to hear that again. Part of the mission of the people of God is to make the world a better place by speaking truth to power locally, nationally, and globally while living in a way that shows fidelity to the word that we teach and preach. Amos, he makes some bold moves. He goes to the temple. He basically goes to the national cathedral and tells the people that God has set up a plumb line next to them and that they have come up out of square. Amos informs them because idol worship had been, become part of their national culture and that their priest was allowing it and not speaking against it and, and that God was setting a plumb line against the house of Jeroboam and, and the king and Israel and all of its leadership are going to be exposed that they indeed are crooked. Question is, if Amos, if we got the invitation Amos got, would we be bold enough to stand up and speak that word? What about, are we bold enough to stand by that plumb line, the plumb line that calls us to align ourselves with God, to be straight and true and plumb towards God when it's easy, it's easy to forget the plumb line of God. It's easy to let our lives begin to get oriented and straightened and square uh, with our lives and our desires and our kids and our work and our stuff and our leisure. But in those things, we may find that we are lined up perfectly with those things, but that we're out of square with God and God's truth. You know, Amos had to announce that, that there needed to be congruity between the word of God and social relationships. That, that, that they, you, couldn't, you couldn't have piety in worship and then abuse in the community. You couldn't have piety in worship uh, and not reflect it in the relationships in our community and in our families. Amos would say that piety without justice is hypocrisy. That power without justice is autocracy. The plumb line of God remains. What do we see? What do we see and what will we do? We have been entrusted with the gospel, the good news. It's good news that has changed the world. And this good news is bigger than any culture or any country and this good news of God is not in cahoots with any powers or principalities. It doesn't capitulate to the status quo or baptize oppression or marginalization. It's meant to be, what is in the scripture, a light. And when you light a light, you don't put it under the basket. But, but too often we do. A lot of times I think it's just we get busy. But sometimes I think it's uncomfortable so it's easy to let it be covered. We might be more worried about fitting in or filling churches than, than being the hands and feet of Jesus in a hurting world. We, we need the courage and confidence of Amos. He's willing to leave home to step out and speak a hard word. He's honest and he doesn't back down. The, the full weight of his prophecy can't really be appreciated at just thinking about way back then. Um, imagine if you were to walk into a worship service or walk into the National Cathedral um, and to hear somebody stand at the pulpit in the National Cathedral and say, God curse America rather than God bless America. That, that was the message that Amos was asked to deliver to go to the seat of power of the nation that had been given the promised land by God, to go there and announce that they, they were crooked, that they were out of square with God. 
So we have to, we have to think. If we are willing to say, God, bless America, then we have to know that we might have to stand up by the plumb line as well. And that means we need to be at work. We need to be at work. Amos announced that the religious shrines and the, and the house of Jeroboam would be destroyed. If We want to avoid that verdict, that jarring word to that long ago nation, then then, then we have to look for ways to bring uprightness and square and truth, our society, our world, our community, with the Word of God. Because the plumb line of God remains. The question will be, what do we see? What do we see? May we, when we see things... May we work to the day when our prayer becomes a reality, when the kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. May the plumb line of God reveal to us the places that need our attention. And may we be known to have the courage of Amos to rise to the occasion, to go to the margins, and to make things right. So we go from this place like Amos, commissioned. And the Lord's word for you this week is what do you see? What will you see, Bonville? What do you see? And what will we do? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 108. God hath spoken by the prophets. Let's stand as we sing together. Let us pray. Oh God, we give you thanks for your call upon our life. May the devotion of this hour spill over as open eyes in the world. May we see the places where there is need. May you help us have visions of how to meet it. We ask your blessing that that we would be faithful like Amos. 
In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.